I started the company with two of my friends who are the co-founders as well, um, Yasin and Saqib. And that was a lot of motivation right there. Similarly, um, some of our professors, some people that we knew were able to give us technical assistance. And we also joined this incubator, which was a tech incubator. Normally, they would have a lot of IT-based startups. We were one of the only hardware startups there. But that sort of community, that sort of engagement, exchange of ideas actually helped a lot. And so I'm a civil engineer by profession, but the idea purely came out of a social cause for Modulus Tech. And this was back in 2016 when I was in my final year, actually. We were witnessing one of the worst displacements we've ever seen in the world, which was the Syrian refugee crisis. And being Pakistani, you can relate to it quite well all the migrations that happen in Pakistan with the Afghan refugees, with the internally displaced people. What we realized was a huge challenge for rehabilitation. Rehabilitating these people was to provide them housing, in fact. It's easier to provide them with tents, but it wasn't really a long-term solution. Using better technology that can be set up in minimal time at a lower cost. And then considering the scale of the problem, just to give you an idea, 1.6 billion people lack adequate housing today. So the idea was to make them sustainable as well. So that was the sort of moonshot idea. Flat pack system. So a bit like components and pieces that come together, but already built and ready to be installed and all plug and play in that sense. And this system enabled us to flat pack up to 11 units in a single sort of truck. So very easy to transport. This was all factory built. So this could be scaled exponentially. At the same time, the it was meeting all those metrics and then the build time was coming to one day per house. So it sort of worked perfectly for rehabilitation, especially post disaster, but also for affordable housing at large. And that's the market we're focusing on. And that's where we feel we can create the most impact. We haven't seen a similar example. Normally when you talk about sustainable housing, the prices usually double or a lot more than conventional homes. So that was perhaps one of the biggest challenges. How do we make it sustainable? Our challenge is around the way that the houses fit together. And then we put a lot of constraints on ourselves. For example, each component seems to be less than 40 kilos so that people can pick it up manually. You don't need a crane to set it up. And in terms of PR, in terms of conferences, um, this particular connection was made um, when I was giving a talk at Stanford. This other speaker was actually part of this project working in Jordan. And I later reached out and offered if we could help them in any way. And that's how that started. The Berkeley one was someone who read an article online and were like, okay, this is something that they want to uh, help with. So it's just really just being out there, talking about it, creating awareness about the company. And I think that goes a long way. Push that we need and start doing your own company, starting from scratch is incredibly difficult. It's been a lot of hard work and that's the sort of drive that we get from the, that potential impact that we can create. Recently, one of the happiest moments for me has been when one of the families was selecting the homes that we built and they were just full of prayers and they were so happy they get to own a house. So that just really feels nice inside and that's the motivation for the team mostly. We're seeing our market in all the pink countries. That's mostly in Africa and Asia. Africa is perhaps a bigger market. And right from the beginning, our focus has been that international sort of market. And that's how the product is designed to be so scalable from the beginning. So we've been very ambitious with our goals. We've now done projects all across Pakistan and are soon doing a pilot in Africa and also looking at South American opportunities, especially in Mexico, Brazil. So yeah, it's actually the product that we're doing makes more sense in Africa because the construction costs there are double than in Pakistan. So it's even more impactful in that sense in terms of cost perspective. And likewise in South America, the construction cost is much higher. So it has that sort of global market but manufacturing ourselves. And that was good at that point because we were doing a lot of R&D, continuous innovation. And now that it's becoming more refined, we've switched to an outsourcing model. So we were able to grow by 10x in just one year without any additional capital invested. So that sort of model really helps with the large global audience that we're focusing on, which is affordable housing. And as many houses we can build wouldn't be enough considering the way that the population is growing, the way that the world is urbanizing. So yeah, it's it's going to be a long journey. Manufacture locally, especially for the larger projects that we're looking at. For smaller projects, we can export from Pakistan and that still makes a lot of sense for them. But for the larger projects, the benefit of this becomes that you're creating employment in Africa and, and in those local communities as well. So it's sort of a win-win scenario. You're giving them houses, creating employability, and giving them perhaps new ways of creating revenue for themselves.
Yeah, honestly, it's being used by everyone, even coal power plants now, which is interesting. But my biggest concern has been, okay, you can call your product sustainable or your business sustainable, but you need to quantify how really sustainable it is. And that's what we've done with our business. Every product comes with a carbon label. We have carbon clock on our website. It's right on the homepage showing how much carbon we're saving on a real-time basis. Then we have 90% lower emissions, 90% lower embodied carbon in our products, and then they're net zero in the on an annual basis in terms of energy. So we've got it certified. We've got the IFC's ED certification for our products. We meet the advanced standards over there. And then we continuously monitor and one of our KPIs is actually carbon savings. So manufacturing process, we have zero waste facility. Any manufacturing leftover is used for furniture. Similarly, even the operations are carried out using solar power. So whatever drill or small equipments you need, they're all run on solar at the site. So we're trying to create like this whole ecosystem where everything is done as sustainably as possible. Yeah, so our equivalent of FEMA would be the NDMA, the National Disaster Management Authority. And then again, they have, they focus more on relief. Um, no one was really focusing on rehabilitation in, in the long-term basis. This was the exact challenge that we were focusing on solving through better technology. The way that the product is designed, we can deploy it very quickly. So it works perfectly for any sort of displacements because you can set it up very, very quickly. And then given this current circumstance of climate change and its impact on Pakistan, it makes a lot of sense to go with something which is net zero or close to net zero. The product sort of solves all those problems and with one sort of solution. Much longer, they take a lot of space, cost a lot more, aren't really sustainable. So yeah, it could work in all those places that you've mentioned. It's sort of market agnostic. Yeah, that would, that's in our long-term objective, in our long-term strategy, where we're focusing on even tiny housing in the United States, making that more scalable, more sustainable at the same time. We focus on dignified living, so we won't make a tent, we won't make temporary shelter. Even our temporary solutions, they're a lot more dignified. So we actually focus on long-term housing, housing that can last at least 50 years and give you a sense of better standards of living. So end-user financing was another challenge that we faced later on with regards to the business model. And we ended up using a mortgage program in Pakistan, a first one of its kind where you could provide mortgages to people who don't even have salaried income but daily wages and this is the bottom 40 person that we're looking at in Pakistan and other similar developing countries so the mortgage program works much better the end user has to pay 15 percent down payment which these families normally to have in savings and then it's as low as 60 dollars a month after that for the next 20 years so this becomes a lot more doable what we also do is that we bundle electricity through solar within that price so they get a free integrated solar supply of 24 7 electricity they also have water connections waste management all built in to this price point yes the mortgages that we're currently doing they do the bank requires the insurance in place but also in most developing countries yes it's been something new in these countries but we see similar policies in Indonesia and in Brazil now in Pakistan with the Nea Pakistan housing development program called Mira Pakistan Mira Ghar. in Brazil you have something very similar called Mina Casa Mina Vida in Indonesia it's the same 5% mortgage rate so a lot of these developing countries are catching on because they do realize that if we can provide housing for the bottom lower 40% of the income pyramid, then it adds a lot of economic value. So the way that we operate, it's com completely through the private sector. So we actually purchase the land, then we build the houses, and then we mortgage them to the end user through a partner bank. For the land, first of all, the topographical surveys, the flood assessment is very, very necessary. We checked it later on. And if they do have sort of a risk of some kind, then we design accordingly. That happens in terms of the legality of the homes. That's also a big challenge in developing parts of the world where you have to check the leases and make sure it's completely uh, properly done so that the banks don't have an issue later on and that it gives the people who are moving in an asset later on for their family. And we've seen in cases where the land is half the price when they move in but doubles after two or three years so it becomes an asset for the family by land from the developers so we would sort of make a deal with them where we would 
bulk buy and sort of lower the price for the end user. So a lot of strategies go into lowering the price. So the price point in Pakistan, in Karachi, which is the most expensive real estate in Pakistan, this is a housing community half an hour from the downtown, and we've priced it at seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars, including the land and solar in, included. And that's a price point that people in Karachi can afford. If you're working in Lahore, we look at the sort of income classification and see what the bottom forty percent are making and can sort of earn. So it has to be one third of their sort of monthly income that needs to be spent towards housing, which is a general thumb rule. So we price the houses accordingly and we negotiate the prices and then we even look at the size of the land accordingly so that bottom 40% can afford without having to part with 90% of their income. Affordable for urban to very urban and that's where we see most of the houses being built but also where we're seeing more demand. So just to give you an idea, there's a statistic by UNHAP it says 70% of the homes that would exist in Africa and Asia by 2050, they haven't been built yet. So that's the rate that urbanization is happening in these developing countries. And that's why our focus is more towards urban areas where we're seeing a lot of people move in for work and have jobs and the population's increasing drastically. So we can't build a home in one of these shanty towns because the land isn't really, doesn't have proper documentation. So what we're doing is that we're moving them to separate locations, different, slightly far away from where they ex currently located. So for example, community development is very important. And yeah, all the projects that we do, all the land that we sort of purchase has proper access to sewerage, electrical connections, all of that. Yeah, so with um, sort of projects we have in um, discussions right now, we're trying to find new data because the previous data that we have, the places that got flooded, weren't on the flood map. So we need to create new flood maps, collect new data, and then build communities. And that's the sort of push that I'm making where I can to reassess and remodel and then build. We don't want to build, invest billions of dollars again, and then have other floods, you know, damage the homes again. And it was very cross discipline but just having that different mindset, I think added a lot of value to the company. Later on, in terms of collaboration, especially technical one, we collaborated with this team from University of Berkeley. There were PhD candidates who wanted to take up our project as one of their research projects. And they were able to give us more energy modeling data and help us even optimize it further. We're helping a team from Stanford. These are also a team of PhDs that we're helping design a flat pack system for refugees in Jordan. We believe in collaboration and helping each other because a lot of people helped us. We sort of had this vision. We, it's a social enterprise at the end of the, uh, of the day. So we, we try to help each other out. Just like to add that it's, it's a good thing to collaborate and in Pakistan, we really need that. We need all the experts, all the resources we have to come together. It's a sort of work on this big challenge that we have now of rebuilding one third of the homes in our rural areas. So it's not something that modelist tech can solve on its own. It's not something that any organization can solve on its own. We all need to work together on this.